Good morning, NYU. Uh, I, 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 I'm actually just curious about something because of what something Andy said. Um, can all the Canadians in the room please put up their hands? Uh, okay. Can all the non-Canadians in the room please put up their hands? Okay, see, there are more non-Canadians. Great. Uh, those of you who uh, uh, are not Canadian, uh, you might be surprised to see so many Canadians here in New York. Uh, you shouldn't be. Uh, there's a whole thing about uh, Canadians uh, engaged around the world at the UN, uh, in, in the great cities of the world, uh, in, in business, in arts, in, uh, in every possible field of endeavor from science to research and everything. Uh, so really it's always a pleasure for me uh, to go around the world and meet with uh, so many people who uh, either are Canadian or have friends who are Canadians or have co-workers who are Canadians or study with Canadians. Uh, there really is something extraordinary to celebrate in a country that is uh, as engaged and uh, interested in the world as we are. And Quite frankly, one of the things that I, I try to point out is uh, in uh, this last election campaign, people are talking a lot about what, uh, what we were able to do and what we've been able to do since uh, the election campaign, but a whole bunch of it and the, the heart of what we did uh, came through listening to Canadians, uh, engaging with people, talking about the kind of government we want, the kind of values we wanted to put forward in the world, and making sure that uh, that that the folks they elected and the government uh, that we would form uh, reflected uh, those ideals and those values. And a huge part of that, for me, uh, was how we reached out to young people. Uh, because quite frankly, uh, from actually my pathway into politics was uh, through youth activism. I was uh, head of Canada's National Youth Service Program for a number of years, uh, butting directly up against uh, a federal government that wasn't always enthusiastic about investing in youth programs. And you can sort of understand why uh, so, po so many politicians are tempted to disregard young people a little bit because uh, there's a vicious cycle going on where young people don't vote and therefore politicians don't reach out to them and then young people are even less inclined to uh, feel valued or interested in politics and it sort of spirals down uh, till turnouts for young people are lower, have been lower than for other demographics. But that was based to my mind from having worked with so many young people over my life as a teacher and then as an activist, uh, on a faulty assumption that young people didn't care about the world or that they weren't interested in what their communities were doing and where we were going and how things were happening. Young people, as you know, are more interested, more engaged, more involved than, uh, than any generation of young people before. With more tools to do it, there's just a level of frustration about their capacity to actually be listened to and to actually impact and affect change. And quite frankly, politics wasn't doing a very good job of actually valuing young people's input, so why would you get involved? And we saw that that was very much happening in Canada at the same time as people were cynical about the divisive and attack nature of politics. Uh, so we put forward a narrative that was much more about listening, about collaboration, about respect, about looking for common ground and pulling people together, and very much engaging young people as not just, you know, letter stuffers and sign putter uppers in our campaign, but drivers of uh, policy and engagement and mobilization uh, in concrete ways. And the model, the number of um, older folks I met who said, uh, my kids convinced me to vote for you, uh, was really reassuring to me because, uh, it, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, happen in, in a traditional model. Uh, so for me, as we look to the future, as we look to this generation that is coming of its own, uh, that you all represent here, this uh, excitement, this engagement around the big thorny issues of our time, whether they be around climate change and how to make sure we are building a strong, uh, opportunity-filled economy with uh, uh, the right path that includes everyone, at the same time as we are uh, protecting uh, the natural world, ecosystem services, and the, uh, and the environment that sustains everything that we have, including our economy. Getting that 
done together is one of the big challenges of our time, and that's why uh, you know, we're, we're here in New York right now uh, as, a, as a country uh, to make sure that we're signing the Paris Declaration to move forward in concrete ways, even though uh, we all know this isn't going to be easy. There are going to be massive challenges for every country around the world, including countries, and especially countries like Canada that still have uh, a large part of its, uh, its economy and natural resources, and quite frankly, always will. But how we innovate and how we do better about how we are energy efficient and better in terms of reducing emissions and more responsible is part and parcel of how we're going to build. And whether it's around uh, natural resources and energy, whether it's around uh, diversity, which is an extraordinary strength that we have as a country, whether it's around uh, the engagement uh, with the world that Canada uh, does feel as such a, a, a natural part of who we are. Uh, I'm really, really excited about the opportunities uh, that I have um, as a Canadian um, showcasing what we're doing to the world, but also that we collectively have uh, as citizens at a time where the world is going through some really interesting challenges and really difficult um, struggles. So having the opportunity right now to uh, engage with all of you is uh, really, really important to me. And, and, I, and I know all of you feel you're going to get something came out of this. Uh, as we're approaching exam times, you took a morning off from studying and classes and came to, uh, came to hear me, so you think you're going to get something out of this. I'm going to tell you, I am going to get a tremendous, uh, a tremendous amount out of this, because for me, the questions that you're going to ask over the next hour uh, will help uh, remind me of what is really uh, mattering to you, where uh, your concerns are, uh, where the issues that uh, you think there needs to be more action or uh, questions that you're struggling with. Uh, this is your chance to uh, ask, to challenge, to uh, share uh, your concerns and your worries uh, with uh, someone who, quite frankly, I've been um, trying to do this throughout my entire career and am um, clinging to the ability to continue to do this now that I'm in a governance position because staying connected with all of you who are thinking very seriously and deeply, not just about the future uh, in an abstract way, which you do, but also thinking about it in a very concrete way that embraces change. I mean, in any uh, any person's life, once you get into the mode of having you know, a career path and a mortgage and uh, uh, orthodonty bills for your kids and uh, retirement savings, you're, on, you're in a long-term reflection that is fairly linear. You're predicting the world is going to stay pretty much stable. Well, all of you are at a point where most of you have no idea where you might be in two or three years what you might be doing, where you might be living, what kind of uh, adventures or new challenges you're going to be facing. And that capacity to be excited and optimistic about radical change, uh, which is the norm right now and has been as you've gone through you know, high school, college, university, and, and into the working world, uh, is it's a time in your lives that we as a society need to make sure we're harnessing so that you challenge us and push us to think beyond the comfort level of a predictable future. And I think that's why young people have so come into uh, their own and, and an essential place of, of empowerment and influence uh, as we look at how we build uh, a better future uh, for this planet and on this planet. So I am uh, really touched to be here this morning, and uh, I'm looking forward to taking uh, as many questions I can as I can in, in the coming hour. So uh, uh, merci beaucoup tout le monde, and I think we're going to start uh, right here. I'm going to sort of go around the room like this until I get dizzy and fall over, uh, or until you guys run out of questions. So uh, we'll start right here. There we go. With someone right there. Uh, hi, Prime Minister Trudeau. It's really great to see you in person. It's such an honor for you to come visit our university. Um, and I'm really glad that you opened your, your conversation by talking about youth engagement, because that's something that I think, um, as a Canadian, has been an issue f for us as well. Um, my peers and I, I think, have felt disenfranchised, partially because of the electoral system. And I was wondering if you have any plans on getting rid of the first-past-the-post system and arranging something that's a little bit more proportional for uh, 
Canadian representation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, I have committed to electoral reform. Uh, this last election uh, is uh, going to be, have been the last one in Canada done under the first-past-the-post system. Um, there are many different reflections to be had uh, over what we now need to do and what kind of system we need to bring in. And for me, I always go back to the basic purpose. If we're going to change something, why are we going to change it and what is the outcome we want? And when you talk to someone who talks about electoral reform, one of the first things they tend to say is, oh, uh, we need to make sure that every vote counts. And then my question is, okay, that sounds like a good thing, but why? What, what is the result that you want? It's not just a uh, intellectual exercise in what perfect democracy might look like. The outcome we want out of any electoral system is a good government with good governance that reflects the views of Canadians, that values uh, the voices of every elector, uh, that uh, reflects the concerns and hopes and dreams of uh, the broadest number of people and makes good decisions in the interest both of the short term and the long term of the country. That's the purpose of elections, uh, to get a good government. Now, how to go about doing that is a really complicated question, and it varies from every different jurisdiction and level in the world. If you have a country that's uh, small geographically and fairly homogenous, uh, a system uh, could work there very well and be right for them that wouldn't work for a very large, heterogeneous country with uh, very yeah, unequal distributions of population. So the reflection that I'm trying to launch now uh, is very much going to those root elements of what is the best way to give good governments and good governance to a country? What are the values that underpin uh, the principles around our electoral system. And putting aside the question of, oh, this will be good for this type of political party and this will be good for that type of political party, take a simple example like diversity. We want our government and our parliament to reflect a broad range of views of Canadians, right? Absolutely, we can all agree on that. Well, there's multiple different ways of doing that. You can have you know, 50 different parties in the House of Commons uh, in our parliament, each representing a different perspective and view and voice, and make sure that that's a way we highlight the diversity. Or you can have a uh, fewer number of political parties that do a better job of reaching out to include a broad range of voices and perspectives within their political parties. Do you want to reward difference, or do you want to re re reward accommodation and inclusion? No, and I'm not going to tell an answer on that, although I, I have my own reflections as a leader of a big tent liberal party that values diversity, uh, but uh, the, the perspective we have is we have to ask ourselves these questions. What is it that we need to value? Do we need to augment and value minority voices in Canada? Do we have a charter that does that reasonably well and we need to focus instead on, on binding together uh, common themes and common values? So this is a really interesting uh, foundational question in our governance system and, and almost at a political science level that I am really hoping we're going to be able to uh, engage with in a thoughtful, responsible way that isn't just about, well, how does this impact on my preferred political party in the next election? Because quite frankly, I, I trust electors. I trust citizens to be able to work through whatever system uh, in order to get an outcome that resembles them. But at the same time, can we optimize that system so uh, that it does a, the best possible job of representing the values, the views, the hopes, the dreams, the concerns uh, of uh, its electorate? And that's, uh, that's why I'm excited about this conversation. But at the same time, I'm challenged by the fact that there was a huge desire for electoral reform when the current election, uh, electoral system uh, gave a result that uh, a lot of people were really dissatisfied with. And so far, people are fairly pleased with the way I'm governing. So they're like, well, the electoral system worked out just fine because we got a decent government. Um, I still believe we need to push for electoral reform because uh, I, you know, I think uh, uh, we need to have a better system that will uh, hold the test of time uh, and not just sort of swing back and forth between we love it, we hate it, we love it, we hate it. Anyway, uh, and I'm going to try and shorten my answers too because I know there's a lot of questions. Here we go. Someone else. Here we are.
Um, hi, as a graduate of Sir Winston Churchill secretary, uh, Secondary, I want to say that I'm sad I've never been in your class, but I'm so thankful that you're allowed us to ask you questions today. <laughs> Uh, my question is, I think a lot of young voters um, like me, a first time voter in your election, are disillusioned because a lot of politicians promise radical change and then we don't see them once they're in office. Um, I remember you campaigned hard against pipeline building Heartburn, but recently you've promised to build more pipelines in Alberta. Just how, how do you justify to young people that uh, we're not investing in green energy, instead we're still putting money into dirty oil sands you know, how, how do you justify that to the young people and how should young people feel when they listen to politicians promise a lot of radical change and then um, have some doubts in their mind in the future? That's, uh, that's a, great, uh, a great question and it, and it does sort of go to uh, one of the points that, uh, that needs to be uh, highlighted, that every voter has a responsibility uh, to uh, get informed about positions that people have. Uh, I uh, went down to New York about two years ago uh, when I first got elected, uh, sorry, to Washington two, two and a half years ago when I first got elected leader of the Liberal Party uh, and made a strong case for why the Keystone Excel pipeline should be approved. And I made that case uh, to a room full of American Democrats and liberals who didn't agree with me. But I have always been consistent around the fact that uh, we need to make sure we continue to grow our economy and create jobs. We just need to do a far better job of making sure we're not doing that at the cost of uh, the planet uh, or our own backyards uh, or uh, the, the, the world that our, our kids and grandkids are, are hopefully going to be able to grow up in. And uh, I understand better than most uh, that the previous government didn't do uh, a very good job of being concerned about the environment at all. Uh, and because of that, uh, a shortcut to being concerned about climate change and wanting action uh, was to uh, demonize uh, the energy resources in Western Canada. They were an easy scapegoat. It's easy to say, you want to save the planet? Just block those pipelines and everything will be easy. Well. We know that's not, uh, that's a simplistic solution that can be very appealing, uh, but uh, if it does then involve everyone leaving their car at home and all of us uh, stopping to use fossil fuels tomorrow, uh, we realize that our world would come to a crashing halt. So we have to be actually a lot more thoughtful and reasonable in our approach. Right now, uh, oil is being shipped by rail across Canada, and one only has to look at the uh, newspapers recently to know uh, that uh, rail uh, disasters, uh, including in, 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 uh, involving fossil fuels, uh, have had a terrible, terrible impact, and pipelines are actually a safer way of transporting oil. Now, do I agree that in the future we're going to have to get off fossil fuels? Absolutely. Is that future tomorrow? No, it's not. So in the meantime, how can we make sure that, A, we are being as responsible as possible in how we develop our natural resources, how we extract them, how we uh, export them, and at the same time, how are we are doing everything we can to get beyond fossil fuels, to replace them with renewables, to find those solutions, to explore those solutions, that is going to mean we can get off them efficiently. But we're much better off doing that from a position of capacity to invest and research uh, than doing it uh, you know, by firelight in a cave uh, 100 years from now when we've reached a collapse because we haven't engaged with it. I mean, these are, these are complex questions to which we are all collectively part of the solution. And the more we engage in a responsible, reflective way, instead of uh, trying to uh, scapegoat or highlight uh, you know, one particular area because it, it has had bad PR for uh, the past 10 years, um, is not the responsible approach to a very difficult issue that I think we need much more of. Uh, so my position has always been, we need to continue to make sure that we have good jobs and a strong future, but make sure that as we move forward, more and more of those jobs are not dependent on uh, a 
uh, you know, high carbon economy. The solutions will be around education, innovation, science, um, efficiencies, uh, changing behaviors, uh, changing the ways our cities work, investing in public transit, uh, investing in research. These are all things that we are very much doing as a government. But it's not going to happen tomorrow, and we need everyone to be part of the solution so it can happen you know, in uh, a rapid enough timeline uh, for us to prevent uh, the two degrees of warming, or, or ideally the 1.5 degree of warming that we know uh, could, be, uh, could be extremely problematic for the world. Thank you. This section. Here we go. Good morning, Prime Minister Trudeau, and thank you for coming to NYU instead of Columbia this morning. Oh, <laughs> I, you know what? <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. Um, I was a committed volunteer on Minister McKenna's campaign, and I really felt this youth engagement going on in the Liberal Party. But unfortunately, I think um, there's a large section of our youth in Canada that is marginalized, and that's the First Nations population of Canada. Um, I also believe traditionally, you know, they can set an example for how to treat our environment and our world. Um, you know, one in two children are, who are First Nations live in poverty and only four out of ten make it through high school. Um, does your government have any plans to help improve their quality of life? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, volunteerism on the campaign, but thank you for uh, uh, going right to the heart of one of the really, really important issues we have. Uh, my next question is going to be from the back section, so uh, I haven't forgotten you guys, so we will come back and make sure Mike's back there. Um, the, um, the fact is, uh, Canada does a pretty good job of, of trying to you know, talk a good game on human rights and development and uh, positive action on the world stage. Uh, but if we're going to be honest, we have to reflect on the fact that uh, over the past uh, decades, indeed centuries, uh, we have failed uh, to um, honor the spirit and the intent of the original relationships uh, with indigenous peoples uh, that settlers uh, came into when, when, uh, when uh, our ancestors arrived uh, on Turtle Island. Uh, we have um, consistently marginalized, um, <laughs> engaged in colonial behaviors, uh, in destructive behaviors, in assimilationist behaviors uh, that have left a legacy of um, challenges uh, to um, a, a large portion of, uh, of, uh, of uh, people who live in Canada are indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples. That's why uh, one of the things we committed to is uh, reshaping the relationship. Um, beginning a relationship based on partnership, on trust, on a nation-to-nation -nation engagement uh, that respects the fact that we are supposed to collaborate together and work together as shared stewards of this land and uh, build a brighter future and opportunities for everyone in it. Um, the fact is that young people in indigenous communities uh, you know, don't have as much invested in their education as a young person uh, in a non-indigenous community. And we need to get to parity. Uh, we need to address the infrastructure challenges. We need to address the boil water advisories that still happen. We need to uh, address the uh, educational outcomes, the health outcomes, the uh, mental health and addiction challenges that we're unfortunately um, you know, getting uh, bad news on almost every single week these days. There is an awful lot of work to do. We have started by, in our last budget, putting forward, in, a few weeks ago, putting forward an $8.4 billion investment over five years uh, to start moving forward uh, in a substantive way. It's more than has ever been committed uh, in, uh, in, in new funding for uh, Indigenous communities. Uh, but it's not going to be enough, and this is not an overnight problem to solve. Uh, it is something that we are going to have to look at over time, uh, but we are beginning uh, to get this right. And uh, I am encouraged, uh, not just by the conversations I've had with uh, Indigenous leadership, uh, but by the extraordinary uh, young people who are stepping up in communities across the country from very difficult circumstances to show uh, leadership, to show uh, ability, and to show that uh, there is a tremendous future, not just for them, but for all of our country, uh, if uh, we begin to actually build the right relationships. Thank you. Question from the back. Uh, good morning. <laughs> I like your shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, my name's Jake. I'm a student at the College of Arts and Sciences, and as you all have noted by the laughter, I think the jersey gives my nationality away. Um, we're my question, modest folk, yes. you know, Canadians, yes. It's the first day I got to show my patriotism as a student here, so it's a, a good day. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is about peacekeeping. Um, and growing up as a Canadian, um, going to school and understanding our legacy from the Right Honorable Lester B. Pearson and his programs to really become the father of the United Nations peacekeeping program. Um, it seems that in the past several decades, um, our efforts through the, the United Nations peacekeeping program have um, not um, been uh, at the same standard that they have been in, in like during, for example, the Suez Canal crisis when it began. Um, and most recently with someone like Romeo Dallaire during the Rwanda crisis, a man credited with saving nearly, I think, 32,000 people's lives during that genocide. Um, and in recent years, I think, out of 70,000 UN peacekeepers, we only had around 131 Canadians represented um, throughout all of them. Um, I was wondering what your government um, would do to maybe uh, reju rev revitalize, rejuvenate our peacekeeping efforts and really um, represent that um, it's not just in our past, but it's our future as Canadians to represent um, the United Nations peacekeeping efforts across the world. Excellent. Th thank you very much for your question. And uh, it's something that actually we have uh, committed to uh, re-engaging with the UN peacekeeping. When uh, President Obama uh, last September sort of refreshed and relaunched United Nations pe peacekeeping, uh, uh, I, uh, I stood up and said, yes, Canada has an awful lot to offer, uh, whether it's uh, bilingual officers, whether it's uh, specialists, whether it's uh, uh, a capacity to uh, engage in the world in uh, difficult places without some of the baggage that so many other Western countries have, either uh, colonial pasts or perceptions of uh, American um, imperialism as, 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 uh, as a critique that's often out there. Uh, that challenge um, is something that Canada is absolutely right to uh, choose to rise to. But I, I do want to highlight um, that there are pieces of our history that a lot of people uh, tend to overlook when we talk about peacekeeping. Um, if we were able to play a significant role uh, in the creation of the United Nations peacekeepers, uh, it wasn't just because uh, Lester Pearson was such a brilliant uh, diplomat, although of course he was, uh, and it wasn't just because we're nice and polite and friendly and you know seem to be good at keeping peace, um, uh, although that's probably part of it too. Uh, but a big piece of it was that Canada had a history of stepping up. In the trenches of World War I, and the beaches of World War II, Canadians fought like lions in theaters far from their homes uh, that wasn't directly uh, of uh, danger to Canada. Canadian, young men mostly, uh, from communities across the country uh, stepped up and gave their lives for peace and for values in faraway conflicts. And that shaped the country. Next year, as many of you know, we're going to be uh, celebrating our 150th anniversary since Confederation, uh, which is a great thing. And those of you who aren't Canadians, I encourage you to come up and visit Canada because uh, it's a wonderful place and next year will be a wonderful time, uh, time to be there. But at the same time, a lot of us have the reflection that it'll also be the 100th anniversary next year of the moment where, for many, Canada actually became a nation in its own identity at a place called Vimy Ridge, where Canadian soldiers, for the first time in World War I, were brought together as a, a single group uh, with all the diversity, which was less then than it is now, but still significant diversity of English and French, indigenous and others, uh, coming together and felt Canadian and won that battle through tremendous sacrifice but tremendous valor as Canadians. 
Uh, and that was a moment that was foundational for us. So as we look at what peacekeeping is today and the requirements of peacekeeping, which is not uh, you know, standing uh, in a line like we did on Cyprus between two countries that can't shoot at each other because you might nick a Canadian in between and therefore let's not shoot each other, uh, which is a simplification, but that idea of standing between states uh, was what peacekeeping was in the past. Now, uh, peacekeeping involves failed states and non-state actors and complex counterterrorism and counterinsurgencies uh, that uh, is a lot more complicated than it used to be. And quite frankly, Canada, through NATO missions, through its engagement in Afghanistan, through uh, engagements around the world, has continued to engage in. So even though we may not be as present as we have been in UN peacekeeping uh, over the past years, we have still been very, very present around the world. Can we do more? Should we do more? Absolutely, which is why we've uh, re-engaged and recommitted uh, to the UN and to peacekeeping because uh, we believe fundamentally in, in multilateralism and the work that can be done. Uh, but let's not forget where we come from as uh, people willing to stand and fight and sacrifice for those values uh, that we believe in deeply uh, and are willing to share with the world. Thank you very much. Next question. Yes. Hello. Um, my name is Jahan. I'm a dual citizen of America and Canada, so thank you for coming. Um, I'm a pre-med student, and recently I know that you talked about assisted suicide. I was wondering if you could talk about, especially when it's such a controversial issue, both in Canada and in America, why it's so important. Um, I'm a liberal, which means uh, I believe in upholding uh, and defending people's rights, uh, while at the same time uh, making sure we're protecting the most vulnerable in society. Uh, getting that balance right is at the core of so many uh, big decisions that governments have to make. Uh, and uh, making sure uh, that we are uh, respecting people's freedom to choose uh, in uh, extreme situations, um, you know, in, in how they make end-of-life decisions, uh, is something that I think uh, is in keeping with our values. Uh, at the same time, however, making that decision as a society to empower people to be able to make that choice comes with a very clear responsibility uh, to make sure that it's not abused, uh, that people uh, aren't taken advantage of, that there aren't any of the slippery slope or uh, negative consequences that, uh, you know, for so many people there are real fears around, which is why uh, what we put forward was uh, a uh, responsible piece of legislation that takes uh, the big step of uh, legalizing uh, medical assistance in dying, uh, providing a framework around it, uh, but recognizing the size of the step we're taking, doing it in a thoughtful, cautious way, doing it with care for this first step, which is going to be a massive change for uh, our country and for uh, end-of-life care. At the same time as we do that, we know we have to do a lot more uh, around palliative care. Yes, Canada's healthcare system is pretty good, but we need to do more around uh, palliative care so that uh, people uh, are making these decisions uh, not because uh, they're not getting good enough care uh, as they uh, live out their days, but because it is truly their choice. So investing in palliative care is a big piece of it. And there are other questions that we will further be studying in the coming years about uh, expanding access to uh, a slightly larger group of, of people than uh, we talked about initially uh, in this legislation. So it's, it's an approach that is uh, reasonable based on facts, evidence, consultations, uh, done with care, uh, but understanding that this is a big societal change that uh, people are going to grapple with in very personal and very different ways. Uh, and that we have to make sure uh, we are as thoughtful as possible in how we move forward on. Thank you. Okay, next question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, you had the mic, so then you get to do it. Sorry. <laughs> Mashal Bouin from the College of Arts and Science. I'm from Pakistan. First of all, I would really like to commend you for your gender-based uh, cabinet. But we still live in a world where women face discrimination in all spheres of life. What can we do to make sure there's women empowerment and gender equality worldwide? Thank you. Um, 
Uh, thank you for your question. And, and one of the first things that I, I will note on this is that there's an awful lot of people who have um, made a big deal out of the fact that I say at any chance I can get, so I'm going to repeat it now, that I am a feminist. Uh, that for me, no. <laughs> oh. Come on, guys, you disappoint me. We were so close to you going, yeah, duh. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't want that to be a reaction point. And one of the things that I recognize uh, is that a big piece of this is um, not that you know, I'm particularly, uh, you know, I'm okay, uh, but that I am just, to my mind, one of the first examples of our generation uh, to actually reach a position of uh, real authority and actually be able to get to a, 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 a level of international influence by, by being the leader of a G7 country. Now, my friend Matteo Renzi in, in Italy is actually a couple years younger than me, uh, but uh, but I don't know. We're, I'm 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 resonating a bit right now and. What it is for me is that I just am a product of this generation where equality, obviously, uh, respect for each other, yeah, diversity, sure. I mean, like, wh where are the pushbacks? And, and understanding that this generation in general is one that is much more open, respectful of diversity, understanding that uh, equality is not just the right thing to do, it's an incredibly uh, important thing to do if we're going to be successful as a world, uh, and that we still have a lot of work to do on it, uh, is something that I am uh, constantly reminded and in inspired by. Uh, so, and I know, uh, that you know, a, a lot of young people tend to call themselves progressive in their approach. Well, you can't be a progressive and not be a feminist, in my mind, because saying, yes, uh, equality of men and women uh, is uh, a baseline element that we need to build on, and we have an awful lot of work to do. If you agree with those two statements, guess what? You're a feminist. Um, and making sure that we all are comfortable identifying ourselves that way as women, obviously, but as men as well, uh, is something we need to really make sure we're doing. I had a really interesting comment the other day um, where everyone knows that I have a, a, a gender uh, equal uh, cabinet, so uh, 15 men, 15 women uh, running the country. But at the same time, uh, our parliament still uh, is only down around 25% or so, 30%, uh, in, in, and it's not as good as it obviously needs to be. Um, what that meant is when we were assigning committees, uh, we had um, you know, not enough women to put, obviously not to have gender parity on, on every committee, uh, and we have you know, mostly women on the status of women committee. And someone said to me, that's great, but next time, can you put mostly men on the status of women committees so that women can be more present on all the other committees as well? Uh, and I thought that was a really neat way of, of thinking about it, and, and uh, well, we're going to give it a try uh, 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 upcoming, uh, because uh, you know, we need to make sure that everyone is involved in this discussion, and that's certainly what, uh, what I'm hoping we're going to be able to do. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Conboy. I'm a student at the School of Business. Um, and I had a question regarding more climate change and climate capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, so we work right now under a former Canadian Trade Commissioner, and we are trying to accelerate private capital deployment into environmental opportunities. But what we're finding in the US and in Canada is that private partners just see investments like oil and gas as more safer than renewables sustainable. So what do you think are um, the right incentives and policy initiatives that can help accelerate that change? Uh, great question. Well, uh, obviously, uh, government has a role to play uh, in incentivizing investment in renewables because we know we need to go there. And quite frankly, if we recognize that a homeowner who wants to put uh, solar panels on their roof, for example, 
uh, is going to face a significant outlay of capital that they may or may not have uh, when they install those panels, even though they'll be able to recover those costs over the next you know, 10 years or whatever, um, means that they need to have help with the money to be able to outlay that cost initially because it's good for us. So how we think about incentivizing the right behaviors right now so that over time we're more efficient and we save money is obviously something that government uh, can absolutely help with. But at the same time, uh, there's only so much that government can do. And so much of it comes down to consumers and consumer choices. Uh, and recognizing as individuals and as consumers that our choices have an impact. And I know there's an awful lot more awareness now about the provenance of uh, what we buy, of what we eat, of, of you know, where we shop, uh, thinking about the impacts of everyday choices we make as consumers, and that's great. We just need to continue along that way. Government can do a better job of uh, enforcing uh, things like uh, labeling and product information and transparency in to help consumers make the right choices. But ultimately, consumers have to start making the right choices. And the entrepreneurs that I've seen who have figured out how to make uh, the right products uh, that respond to consumers' desires to, uh, re to, to make the right choices, um, I mean, it's not about greenwashing anymore. It's about understanding that there are an awful lot of people out there who are making very, very conscious choices uh, about uh, helping the planet with uh, their lifestyle and, and, their, uh, and their, their purchases. Making sure that we're being a lot more thoughtful about incentivizing, about uh, highlighting that, about encouraging that, uh, is going to go a long way towards uh, people in the business community realizing uh, that there are a tremendous amount of uh, benefits, jobs, and investment opportunities uh, in doing the right thing because that's what consumers are starting to look for increasingly. Thank you very much. Here. Good morning, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you for being here. My name is Miguel. I'm a master's student at the Center for Global Affairs at the School of Professional Studies. Um, bringing it back uh, again to uh, environmental issues, um, the negative impacts of uh, very fossil fuel dependent uh, industrial global food system uh, is widely, widely known in terms of uh, environmental degradation, loss of biodiversity, and then of course there are uh, uh, social and health impacts as well. While there's a growing movement across the world of uh, small-scale local farmers, organic, um, it seems that it's not growing quickly enough and that the odds are stacked against, against these, uh, the people in, this move, in these movements. Um, and there's also the looming uh, danger of the movement being co-opted by big business. Um, so my question for you is, because uh, this is not just a Canada-centric or US-centric uh, issue, um, what, what needs to happen in order for political leaders, global political leaders and big business leaders uh, in order for them to pivot toward making full-on commitments and investment in local and regional food systems uh, and making it not just a priority, but to treat it with a matter of urgency. Thank you. Great question, Miguel. But uh, one of the things you said, uh, you know, the danger about co-opting uh, organic and local farming by big business um, uh, depends on the type of big business that takes it over, doesn't it? I mean, we need to be able to scale up food production to feed the world. Uh, and we need to be able to actually provide uh, nutrition and sustenance to uh, a, a hungry planet. Uh, yes, local, organic, um, you know, smarter practices, whether it's drip irrigation or, or, uh, or uh, you know, better, uh, better use of, of, of uh, um, you know, tilling practices and natural fertilizers and all, all sorts of things that uh, uh, that I, I know just enough about to get me in trouble, but I know there are lots of experts on it. Um, how we make sure that we are uh, adjusting uh, to being able to feed people while at the same time not uh, worsening uh, the situation on the planet is a massive challenge. Uh, but the solution, um, will involve scaling up uh, responsible uh, organic practices. Uh, and whether it's you know, small organic farmers who become much bigger, 
uh, or businesses who understand that uh, doing things responsibly uh, must be the way we move. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a, enough of uh, a, a, a truster in, in market forces to know that if uh, consumers and governments are clear-eyed about where we need to go, uh, the econ economic world will respond. Um, there are real challenges out there uh, because of the pressures uh, placed on, on populations that uh, are in consistent situations of food insecurity. Uh, and recognizing that people have concerns with golden rice and say, because it's GMO'd, and say, well, you know, instead of eating golden rice to get their vitamins, they should eat more mangoes. Uh, well, you know, buying fresh fruits is a luxury uh, not available to massive uh, proportions of uh, the population on this planet. And that's too bad, uh, and it's something we should work to, work to change. But in the meantime, there are steps we need to take uh, to ensure that people are healthy uh, and uh, well-fed, while at the same time uh, trying to do it in ways that aren't going to imperil the planet. And I know there are an awful lot of brilliant people uh, in all corners of the world working very, very hard on this, and, uh, and many of you probably in this room uh, studying fields that will take you into that area. And how we figure out how to feed an entire planet in a responsible, sustainable way uh, without endangering the very planet that is sustaining us and future generations uh, is one of the pivot challenges that for me will determine whether or not we make it through, or certainly determine how we make it through the 21st century uh, as a species on this, on this earth. Thank you, Miguel. In the back. Hi, uh, my name is Ford, and I am a double major in environmental science and politics here at NYU. And my question for you is this. Um, climate scientists at NASA have recently said that the Earth is locked into a three-foot rise in sea levels by the turn of the century which means that a number of the countries that signed Paris agreements uh, won't exist around the year 2100. So the time to act on climate change was really 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, and despite this, there are still politicians and governments that reject the notion of climate change and are refusing to act responsibly. And so my question is, what will you do to act decisively and quickly and work with governments and politicians that reject science and reject climate change in order to prevent further destruction to the planet? Uh, great question, and, and one that I've been struggling with over the past six months since I, since I got elected. Uh, Canada, as a proportion of global emissions, is very, very, very small. Uh, so even if we stopped emitting everything tomorrow, uh, the trend lines and what's going on in the rest of the world uh, would continue. So yes, we have a responsibility uh, to reduce our emissions, and, and we're taking that very, very seriously. But the way that Canada and countries like Canada can have a larger impact than only on their own emissions uh, is by helping larger emitters and helping many countries uh, figure out how to reduce their emissions and how to uh, get to a better place uh, in terms of their, their, uh, their, their climate change challenges. Uh, and that happens many ways. We made a commitment around $2.6 billion uh, a number of months ago uh, to directly help uh, specifically uh, small island states uh, reduce their emission footprint. That means getting them off diesel generators in many cases, uh, looking for hydro solutions, looking for uh, geothermal, perhaps nuclear, looking for uh, other solutions to be able to reduce uh, the carbon footprint around the world. Because as we know well, the atmosphere doesn't care where the carbon was emitted, it just cares that it was emitted. So certainly working directly with countries around the world to help them uh, reduce their emissions. You know, there's carbon capture and sequestration technology that's being worked on in Saskatchewan and elsewhere across the country uh, that could have a tremendous impact in uh, the coal plants that are opening up every week in China, for example. I mean, there are things that we can do and solutions that we can put forward that will have an impact on the global stage. But the other part of it is, also being uh, a bit of a model in Canada. If we can show that even a, uh, a country with extremes in temperature, where most of us need both heat in the winter, well, all of us need heat in the winter, uh, and most of us need air conditioning in the summer, uh, where we have great spaces between our communities and therefore real transportation and travel challenges, where we have fossil fuel resources being uh, a, 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 a 
part, a fundamental part of our economy for now. If we as a country can demonstrate effectively reducing, you know, even our small part of, of fossil fuel emissions, but do that significantly, the solutions that we've created in order to do that while keeping a strong and successful uh, economy uh, with good jobs, with, uh, with the kind of innovation and research and opportunities for uh, people right across the country, uh, while at the same time we're being more responsible for the environment. If we can build that narrative, um, then uh, a lot of countries around the world will uh, pick up on our solutions and, uh, and scale them up to their sides. So I'm not one of those who is uh, gloom and doom about it, but I am very, very aware of the scale of the challenges and Canada's modest uh, but significant role uh, that we can and should be playing uh, in uh, helping solve this, uh, this very serious and fundamental challenge. Thank you. Who's got the mic here? There you go. Uh, Mr. Trudeau, my name is Dieter. Uh, on behalf of the students at the Center for Global Affairs, uh, we want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule today to come speak to us. Uh, and if I may, as a, on a personal level, as a Mexican citizen, I want to thank you for implementing visa-free travel for us Mexicans so we can visit your beautiful country. We're working on that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, mention, uh, now that I mentioned Mexico, as you know, both of our countries share a mutual bond in terms of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, and as you may know as well, one of the main criticisms of NAFTA has been the envir envir environmental impact it's had on our countries uh, since uh, it was implemented in 94. Uh, with TPP around the corner and the signing of the Paris Agreement tomorrow, do you think that TPP itself will go far enough in ensuring environmental protection for all, all three countries, and not just all three, all three countries, but also all members of TPP? I think fundamentally, uh, trade deals are good uh, for the world. Uh, whether uh, whether they're the right deals and whether they're uh, signed the right way and whether they have the right impacts and they're negotiated properly for everyone's best interest is a secondary question that we need to look into. But at a fundamental level, freer and fairer trade uh, is a positive benefit uh, for uh, our planet and for countries within our planet. So uh, that's the position that I start from. And I'm always worried, but it happens every... Uh, every electoral cycle uh, in any country, there's always a bit of a spike in protectionism and uh, an easy narrative about uh, shipping jobs overseas and uh, concerns about all those sorts of things. Uh, but at the same time, the math and the economics are very clear, uh, but also the direct benefit for individuals is always very clear. What we're seeing now increasingly is, uh, particularly with the historic signing of the Paris Agreement uh, on Friday, uh, a much greater level of understanding and admission uh, by the world uh, that climate change is real and requires uh, significant concerted action. Uh, and do existing um, trade deals do enough around climate? Probably not. Uh, do the ones we uh, are going to be negotiating and signing in the future uh, need to do much more? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to our North American Leaders Summit, uh, which uh, uh, is coming up in a couple of months, uh, where uh, I will be able to sit down uh, with President Obama and President Peña Nieto uh, to uh, actually talk about a continental approach to energy and environment uh, and make sure that we are uh, doing uh, everything we can within this significant, um, significant chunk of the world's economy that we represent. Uh, to lead the way uh, and showcase uh, what can and must be done in the coming years. Thank you. Yes. Or, sorry, where's, where's where I keep, the mic's over here on this side, sorry. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm, my name is Juliana. I'm from the Center for Global Affairs, School of Professional Studies. Um, since you are in New York for uh, signing the Paris Agreement, I will insist in the climate topic um, I want to ask a question, having some things in mind. Um, although Canada is not a large emitter in total emissions, it's the fourth largest per capita emitter. So if you want to be a model role... Um, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah, you have a lot of work to do. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so I... I was wondering how could Canada decouple economic growth from fossil fuels? Because um, you mentioned 
uh, before the need for, for the development of indigenous peoples. So how do we stand in the Arctic drilling and what other options do these people have? Oh, I think uh, there, are, there are tremendous options for, uh, for economic growth within, uh, within uh, indigenous communities uh, that aren't related to, uh, to fossil fuels, um, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, fisheries and forestry in, in, in some parts of the country, uh, or uh, much more uh, likely you know, economic growth and innovation through, uh, through participating in the knowledge economy. Uh, we are right now as a planet trying to learn how to think longer term uh, than uh, we have successfully done in the past. I mean, when you think about the sweep of human civilization, we have maximized short-term uh, returns. Uh, we have maximized immediate benefits as a way of seeing, you know, which culture, which civilization gets to dominate at any given time. Who is best at maximizing in short order their impact and concentrating it in one place uh, tends to have done better, and that's what we've rewarded. Uh, that's what sort of we. That's what the 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 unfolding of the world has rewarded uh, over time. We now are at a place where we have to start thinking very differently than that. We have to right now, even with our short-term mindset, start thinking about long-term impacts of our behaviors. The way we wouldn't have have had to when you know there were you know far less humans on this planet and we had such a smaller footprint. We had to think differently about the impacts now of a behavior we have right here that might have an impact on the other side of the world. We have to think both deeply and broadly about uh, how the world works. And when we look to um, indigenous cultures, for example, uh, that have uh, a, a more ingrained reflection on sort of seven generation consequences, uh, a stewardship role and respect for uh, the earth, uh, that is, and uh, living in harmony with uh, the earth, is part of the kind of reflections we actually need to fold into our thinking. So fixing the relationship with indigenous peoples isn't just sort of a moral imperative, although of course it is, uh, it's going to be of benefit to shifting our mindset, our approach, our way of thinking uh, about how the world works. So uh, making sure that we have strong, compelling uh, indigenous voices in positions of power, of authority, in business, in academia, in politics, uh, to help shape the discussion, the reflection, the decisions we take, uh, is going to be a huge part of our path forward. So uh, saying that um, you know, indigenous communities have a future only based around uh, fossil fuel extraction, which I know is not what you're saying, uh, is, uh, you know, would be a step in the wrong direction. Instead, looking at education, uh, innovation, uh, and, and a culture shift that goes with it uh, is for me uh, something that we are very much uh, struggling through right now and uh, one that I know uh, everyone in this room, from all the heads nodding as I was saying that, uh, get. We know we have to change the way we think about the future and our role in it uh, as a world if we're going to thrive through the coming decades uh, and if we're going to make sure that our grandchildren uh, have the kinds of opportunities they need. Uh, and that is, uh, that is something for which we need as many different perspectives to fold in together uh, as is possible. Thank you for your question. Uh, and I think we have one last question here, unfortunately. Hi, Prime Minister Trudeau. Thank you very much for being here. It's an absolute honor to hear you speak. My question is actually about disabilities. So until now, veterans and people with visible disabilities have received a lot of attention, and those with invisible disabilities have kind of been put aside. So I was wondering, throughout your tenure, how do you plan on addressing that issue? Um, I'm actually someone with an invisible disability, and last summer when I was in Vancouver, I was seeking government resources that could help me out, and I couldn't find anything. And so I don't really understand how we're supposed to be able to contribute to society if we can't even help ourselves. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful Thank question. You. Uh, and an important one. Um, part of the uh, cabinet that looked like Canada um, that I appointed, um, was uh, uh, featured uh, two Canadians with, uh, living with disabilities. Uh, one, our Minister of Veterans Affairs, 
uh, is uh, in, a, in, a, in a wheelchair, and it's a fairly visible disability. Um, uh, the other, uh, Carla Qualtro, uh, is our Minister for Sport and Minister for Canadians with Disabilities. Uh, and she uh, is legally blind, uh, but, um, you know, functioning legally blind. Uh, that, that's a terrible thing to say. Uh, she, she, she manages to, uh, to, to make it through uh, and thrive and, and you just have a larger font. And, and, and she's, is an example of, of, uh, of the kind of success and contribution one can make. So one of the things that I've tasked her to do uh, is uh, to create a uh, national uh, act uh, for uh, people living with disabilities. Uh, we need to make sure uh, that we are drawing, I mean, we're only a country of 36 million people. Uh, if we're going to survive and thrive on the world stage, we need everyone to have opportunities to contribute to their fullest potential. And that goes for people living with disabilities, it goes for uh, marginalized communities in our cities, it goes for indigenous uh, Canadians. We need to make sure that we are giving everyone a real and fair chance to succeed. Uh, and uh, how we uh, enable uh, people with disabilities uh, to uh, contribute to uh, the fullest and extraordinary level that they are capable of is something that uh, quite frankly, as you point out, we haven't done well enough in the past and why uh, I have specifically and explicitly uh, targeted, uh, tasked um, uh, our minister to, uh, to address and to make sure that uh, the experience that you had uh, in Vancouver last summer uh, will not be repeated uh, in the coming years. Thank you very much. That's uh, unfortunately all the time we have right now, but uh, I really want to tell you how much I appreciated the opportunity to uh, engage with you this morning, uh, to hear your questions, to uh, you know, talk a little bit about uh, how I think um, young people need to demand um, more from um, their politicians, their business leaders, uh, their community leaders, uh, by being uh, the kind of leaders of today, not leaders of tomorrow, uh, that I know you can be. Uh, you're taking time this morning to come out and uh, challenge me and, uh, and make your voices heard uh, is really important to me. How you continue to engage uh, after this with your peers, uh, with your teachers, with uh, your parents, with uh, your employers, uh, and how you own your own active, engaged citizenship through the rest of your life will determine uh, very much uh, the kind of world we all live in. Uh, and I am, as I always am, uh, inspired and touched by uh, the opportunity to have engaged with you this morning, uh, and I look forward to uh, uh, continuing to uh, engage with you and uh, uh, all sorts of young people across the country and around the world uh, in the coming years. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Thank you very, very much.